Okay. Uh, let's just make a rather short reminder. We have base seen basically two separations. This is the ancient Greek part. I'm writing this here in that section. Actually corresponding to each other or expressing each other in different ways. Okay. Uh, uh, separation of the uh, or differentiation of the externality and internality. Okay, someone, something resides in while confronting the outside, okay? And we filled with these things, internality corresponded to soul, to the idea of soul, and externality, uh, the world, but primarily the body. In its later forms, we have seen that this assumed the form of mind, and matter, and later on, uh, the Kantian conceptualization of consciousness. And the nominal world. Okay. As you see, the almost same uh, dichotomy or dualism uh, were following us from the very beginning up until the Hegelian claim came into the picture, okay, telling us that finally he was able to achieve to establish the unity of all, once again, okay. But you know, this unity of all achieved within the domain of consciousness, almost denying any possibility of outside externality, uh, <laughs> was cancelled out, okay. No possibility. Everything, everything takes place in the Geist. Okay? And there is no outside to Geist. To Geist. Geist can only come to know itself by dividing itself with its own self. Now I'm going to step to another thinker, step on to another thinker. Uh, who prefers rather to problematize the body? But before that, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, what about Lukács? Was I add something more? Yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so you read the article. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, apart from this question, what's further more on Lukács? Okay, what other questions you may have concerning the earlier topics? Or if you have any question related with Lukács, of course, you can come, with, come by with it. But I don't, I don't remember any point at all. Who was Lukács? <laughs> Okay, do you have any questions? You don't have. Okay. <coughs> you don't have any questions and I'm going to start to try to introduce you uh, the ideas as they are presented by Gilles Deleuze in his book Nietzsche. Okay. Uh, simply because Nietzsche is a rather difficult thinker. Uh, his uh, his uh, thought is not systematic on the first place, or it appears not to be systematic, but rather having a very internal systematicity, which is quite difficult to catch up with. Okay, that's why uh, I make use of uh, Deleuze's interpretation of Nietzsche's thinking, and especially selected that part, which is very important for Nietzschean thinking, actually. Uh, as far as I remember, the title of the chapter was Active and Reactive. I'm 
from the book Nietzsche and Philosophy, first published in France in 1962. Okay. Actually, this was quite an influential book after it was published, simply because, as you may know, Nietzsche was one of those people who continuously misunderstood throughout history. Uh, during the Nazi times in Germany, he had been identified as a Nazi, as a fascist thinker. Okay, later on, uh, some Anglo-Saxon and German writers and interpreters tried to save him from this stigma and however, uh, with limited interpretations. When Deleuze's book came out, actually it strike, okay? It strike and forced all the interpretations about Nietzsche to change, okay? So it was quite an important book in that regard. Uh, actually, I don't remember right now, but uh, somebody was saying that, even to the point of saying that, uh, the 20th century Nietzsche is Deleuzean. Okay, that was, I don't remember if it was Michel Foucault or somebody else who said this, okay. But uh, that was quite a strong interpretation. So skipping over the first chapter, okay. <coughs> I'm gonna talk about that chapter titled Active and Reactive, okay. Uh, it is, more than enough, it contains more than enough for our purposes. Okay, I said that uh, we have started with divisions and up until now the overwhelming majority of the thinkers were dealing with the question of uh, uh, thinking. Primarily, finally culminating in the development of the concept of consciousness and Geist, etc all actually neglecting uh, the body, says Nietzsche, okay? And rather he tries to interpret Nietzsche's uh, body and wants to give priority to the body, okay? That is uh, one of the basic, perhaps this would be a basic starting point, simply because there are two very beautiful arguments in relation to this, okay? First of all, uh, the arguments about the consciousness. The apparatus, actually, through which, by making use of which, we come to know things. Okay? As I told you, this is uh, in German, Bewusstsein, maybe translated into English in, uh, as being aware or awareness. Okay, and it's only natural for us to think that, yeah, I mean, for us to be able to be aware of things, okay, things show themselves somehow. We don't know why, perhaps, there are several theories as we have seen, somehow show themselves in our state of awareness, okay, to whom, to us. There's a strange, actually, dualism here, okay. But Nietzsche says something else. Nietzsche says that actually all we are talking about as consciousness is nothing else than a symptom of body. Okay. This is an interesting claim, a peculiar symptom of body, not just any symptom of body. But it's a symptom of body emerging when body is reacting. Okay. <coughs> Actually, uh, by making use of the Hegelian notion of master and slave here, or servants, Okay, Nietzsche would claim that it's only the servant, contrary to Hegel's interpretation, only the servant who develops a consciousness, okay, but not the master, okay. Consciousness is not a self-consciousness, he would say, but rather 
the consciousness of an ego who has no consciousness himself at all. Okay. This means that okay, consciousness develops, enslaves efforts to react the demands or to adapt the dangers posited by the master, existence of the master, okay? And develops a consciousness. But this is not the self-consciousness of the slave, he would say, okay? But rather the consciousness of the master in the slave, okay? So, however, in contrast to this, the master, whose consciousness is in the slave, okay, does not have a consciousness of its own right. Okay. There are very beautiful sentences. Let me take a look at and uh, if I can find them, I'll quote from the text. Okay. Okay. Uh, Deleuze says that in Nietzsche, consciousness is always the consciousness of an inferior in relation to a superior to which he is subordinated or into which he is incorporated. Okay. Consciousness is never a self-consciousness, but the consciousness of an ego in relation to a self which is not itself conscious. It is not the master's consciousness, but the slave's consciousness in relation to a master who is not himself Conscious, okay. And from Nietzsche, Deleuze quotes, consciousness usually only appears when a whole wants to subordinate itself to a superior whole. Okay. Consciousness is born in relation to a being of which we could be a function. In relation to a being of which we could be a function. Okay. So. <coughs> This is strange enough simply because all we have seen up until now was uh, that revolving around the question of what's going on inside consciousness, what's going on inside consciousness and how does it come to relate and we have come to uh, the conclusion that it cannot relate to its externality. Actually it was from the very beginning there, okay, in the difficulty of the soul in commanding the body, in the impossibility of the mind communicating with the body or spirit with the matter in Descartes, and in Kantian conceptualization of the immanence of consciousness. And despite the appearance, the first appearance that you may get from Hegelian thinking, actually, unfortunately, Hegelian thinking cannot crash down this immanence of the consciousness but it can only <laughs> deepens down into its analysis inside the consciousness. Okay? That was the basic problem. However, a body now predominates the picture in Nietzschean thinking, and now consciousness is defined to be a function, a symptom, a symptom of some kind of disturbance in the body. Okay? When the body is forced to react, actually, okay? according to Nietzsche, it develops consciousness. Okay? And it is not an internal consciousness, an independent, autonomous consciousness, as Kant did suggest, but rather it is the consciousness of the superior. Superior in a, is a very difficult term here, actually, it is an expression of valuation, which we will see is a, later, is a very important concept for Nietzsche. Okay? So consciousness as such a reaction, and he would also connect uh, our conception, contemporary or 19th, 20th century conceptions of science, modern conception of science, with the consciousness, and he would also describe science as reactive. Okay? But we do not know yet what reactive is. Okay. So to be able to see this, one has to take a closer look at the question of the body. Okay. Okay. What do we understand by the term? 
Yeah, usually uh, the term belongs to biology and usually refers to our uh, physical being, okay, or biological being, biological being, okay, or uh, the biological being of other things as well. But in its extended usage, okay, it can also refer to something more representing a more or less uh, unity, okay, a body, okay, having a certain determination in being. Okay. okay. Uh, so, actually, there is a very beautiful passage in his Nietzsche's Genealogy of Morals. Where Nietzsche criticizes the, according to him, Christian conception of the soul. Okay. Page after page, paragraph after paragraph, he criticizes as if he was willing to crash down that concept. Okay? But there comes a certain moment in his writing, and he stops there and asks himself, okay, what if, he says, after all, okay, what if did this good old Christian concept of soul may have a usage after all? And then uh, he tries to give a new definition of what soul is. Okay? Apart from all the religious discussions of the soul, okay, he would describe soul as the society of instincts and or drives, sorry. and affects and nothing else he says okay soul is nothing else than a society of drives and affects okay it's interesting simply because with such definition as we will see okay there would remain no difference between soul and body okay the soul and body turns out to be the same according to him. Okay, let's ask themselves then, what are the components of this definition, okay? As you can see, there are three components here, okay? Drives, affects, and their society, okay? Which means that they are together, okay? Interacting with each other, okay? Drives and affects are together interacting with each other. Okay, drives are those actually forces, okay, that directs the soul here or the body there, if you like, okay, towards their outside, okay, towards places that they are not, okay. So let me draw this little line here, okay. <laughs> drives are always driving the entity here. And therefore, on the other hand, we have the affects, okay? Affects, affects are those forces confronting the internal outgoing forces of the drives, okay? In other words, they are incoming forces, okay? Incoming forces and outgoing forces, okay? Now I put my hand on this, okay, an exercise force, okay. This can be re resembled to the notion of drive and the resistance of the desk, okay, affect, creating an affect on my hand. Okay. Fine. Of course, if the desk was able to feel, okay, it would feel the effect of my hand as its own affect, okay. So, in other words, what we are talking about here is a bundle of, or society of, the interaction of, the multiplicity of incoming and outgoing forces. Okay. 
So, when the forces confront each other and do begin to constitute bundles, so to speak, okay, it is at that moment Nietzsche began to talk about the body, okay, constitution of the body. Okay. Forces, conflict, contradicting, uh, colliding with each other, entering into relations with each other, constituting bodies, more or less permanent or transient bodies, okay, according to the Nietzschean conception. Now, the interesting point is that, however, there is a difficulty here, quite a mystical something actually we are talking about, okay? The idea of force. <coughs> what is it? Okay. Cool. We have any idea? Türkçesine kuvvet, değil mi? What is a force? Now, the problem is that with the conception of force, okay, not unlike the physici physical conception of force, which are accepted, which is accepted as if operating over there, okay, Nietzschean conceptualization of the force presents certain difficulties. Okay. First of all, oh, let's start with the first difficulty. First of all, Force do not exist by themselves, according to Nietzsche. Okay. They are simply non-existent when they are not related with any other force. Okay. The second important point is that they emerge when they are related with other forces. <coughs> Now, you see the difficulty? Actually, the related, the term related here hangs on nothingness, okay? Forces are not there, but we are talking about being relatedness, okay? We are going to return back to this difficulty later on, okay? Being relatedness, and it's true being relatedness, forces do emerge. This is the first and serious difficulty. There is another difficulty, though, okay? And it's about the character of the forces. Nietzsche says that forces actually are nothing else than the quantitative differences in relation. Now, the difficulty is with this notion of the quantitative difference, of course. Okay, what do we mean? Yeah. Uh, let's write down certain quanta. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five sticks or apples. Okay. We are talking about the quantitative difference here. Okay. So, emerging in a relation. A relation, according to Nietzsche, would be always producing these quantitative differences. Okay. But quantitative differences, you know, one apple, two apples, three apples, four apples, okay. The difficulty is this, I'm trying to look away, look for a way to be able to tell you the uh, trick, actually. Nietzsche says that the quantitative difference is the irreducible elements in quantity. Okay. What does this mean? Mm, uh, what kind of example? You know, I don't like to work with examples, but the examples turn out to be necessary somehow. Okay, it's, it means this, okay? Even though in each and every case, okay, I have one apple in one apple, one apple in two apples, one apple in three apples, one apple in four apples, one apple in... Five apples, one apple in a 
truck full of apples, okay, it appears that in each and every case, that one apple is the same in quantity. Okay. However, in each and every case, the oneness of the apple differs from the oneness of the apples in other cases. Okay. Does it make any sense to you? Okay. This is what is meant by the irreducible element of the quantitative difference. Okay. It didn't, it didn't make any sense. No comment. Okay, let me return back to the example. Now, I have my one apple here in my hand and I'm going to eat it. Okay. The apple is not enough for me to feel, satisfy my hunger. Okay. I eat one apple and I'm not satisfied. My hunger is not satisfied. I eat two apples, my hunger is satisfied. Okay. One apple is not capable of satisfying the hunger, but one apple in the set of two apples okay, functions in the way of satisfying the hunger. Okay. However, one apple cannot do so. Or, when I am hungry, two apples are very precious for me, but while I have a truck full of apples, I do not care about any number of apples. Okay? So, a tr one apple in a truck full of apples does not mean much for me, but these two apples turn out to be crucial for my survival. <coughs> now is it understood a little bit? Okay, even though from the outside, statistically, in each case, you can count one apple in these different sets. These one apples, however, okay, would never be equal to each other. Okay, that's the point. Okay, this is the irreducible element of the quantity or quantitative difference. Okay. Now, Nietzsche would say that science following the reactive path of consciousness actually would prefer to reduce this irreducible element okay, into an equality. Okay? And it takes, it prefers to take, take each one apples here in different sets as one apples. Okay? Or here, another example, okay, in the set of two apples. One apple, the first apple, does not satisfy my hunger, but the second apple does it. Okay. So they are not equal in their value, actually. Okay. Even though you may still count them each as one apple, okay, their value are different. Where? Their force, if you like, are different. Where? In their being relatedness. Okay. As such, if I was imagining two apples existing in suspense in the vacuum, okay, then it would not mean anything at all, simply because both of them would have no value, no existence. Okay. They would not come into existence. Okay. Simply by being related, now I am thinking of two apples as if they are enough to satisfy my hunger. Okay. So, not only within the context of a relationship and nowhere else, two apples, each one by one, come into existence as force. Okay. A force to satisfy a force creating the effect of the satisfaction of my anger. Okay. Another very good example would be this, actually. I used that example in earlier classes, and it appears that it's the most easy to remember one. Money. Okay. 
I have one lira in my pocket today. Yours pocket is full of hundred lira, full of liras amounting to a hundred. Somebody else's wallet containing five thousand. Somebody else's yet uh, another somebody else's bank account though. Uh, displays a nine-digit figure, say, okay? Etc. Now, you know all these figures are produced by putting together this unit of one neuras. Okay? The problem is though, however, in none of these sets, one neuras are equal to each other. Again, okay. There are two dimensions of this inequality. First of all, one lira in my pocket is enough to buy a tea. Is it enough? No, it's not enough even. Is it enough? It can buy a tea, right? Or a glass of tea. Okay. One lira means tea. Hundred liras perhaps something else, a lunch, and a taxi to home, okay? 5,000 as salary, perhaps, and this capital, okay? And the value of the each one lira within these different sets do differ from each other, do differ from one ras in other sets. This is the first difference, okay, as well. They do differ from the other one ras in their own series, okay, as well. So, for instance, here, that's 900,000 lira, okay, is not the same as the second lira in the set, as well. Okay. That's the problem. However, as you know, in our making science, making its calculations, okay, reduces this difference according to nature, okay, reduces this difference and treats each and every unit as if they are equal to each other, okay. Now, however, insisting on this irreducible element of the quant difference in quantity, actually, he would say that difference in quantity is not in itself enough but gives rise to the difference in quality at the same time. Okay? Just as in the case of the apples, it's so in the case of the money, okay? T money, pocket money, salary, Capital. Okay. They are not the same. Okay. Or one apple, the number of apples enough to satisfy my anger, the number of apples enough to sell out to be able to make a living, etc., do differ from each other. Okay. And this difference, this time, producing actually quantity, qualitative difference quantitative difference or difference in quantity producing at the same time those qualitative differences. Now, what are qualitative differences? Okay. Actually, what's at stake here is nothing else than the genesis of the things. Okay. Genesis of the things themselves, if you like. Okay. These things producing themselves out of quantitative difference, transferring these quantitative differences into qualitative differences. Qualitative differences, as you may understood, arriving at us in the form of effects recognized as predicates in connection with certain subjects. The, the term subject here refers to the pro subject of the proposition. For instance, the table is green. OK? 
okay? The greenness, if you like, okay, is produced on the basis of difference in quantity, translating itself into difference in quality from the red, for instance, from the color red, okay? Now arriving at my eyes in connection with a certain object, making me recognize it as a certain characteristic of that object, a certain predicate of that object, okay? Now I am talking about the green table, okay? All these predicates connected with the same object though, giving me the whatness of the object. What is a table? A table is something which is green, having a certain height, a uh, certain structure of solidity, and uh, a place to sit behind it, and uh, a smooth surface, flat surface to work on, etc., etc. Okay. All these predicates getting united with a su certain subject, and that subject is understood by me as a certain something. Okay. So, according to Nietzsche, therefore, these differences in quantity and quality do have a generic character. They are generating, actually, characteristics, effects. And as you can see, all this can only happen through the operation of forces in relation to each other, being related with each other. If they were not related with each other, nobody would be able to talk about the existence of the forces. Okay? Only, therefore, the forces do not exist by themselves, but only emerge when they are, are interacting with the other forces. Now, after such a discussion, let's return back to the concept of body, okay? Then the concept of body, or body according to Nietzsche, is nothing else than the interacting forces, the society of the interacting forces, okay? The bundle of the interacting forces, interacting with each other. However, here, their interaction is not in a neutral fashion, as we have seen, as we can drive from the discussion of the differences in quantity and quality, okay? Nothing can remain equal, therefore the forces do emerge and out of their inequality they interact with each other, which means that there emerge in their interaction some forces as dominating and commanding and other forces obeying. Okay. He would call them as active and reactive forces. The forces in the body commanding the other forces okay, are called active forces. And the forces obeying the active forces are called by Nietzsche as reactive forces. Active forces commanding, reactive forces obey. Okay. Now don't forget, we are going to connect this conception of reactive with the reactive character of the consciousness. Okay. <coughs> but okay, after the break.